Hi, I'm Phil Anderson and welcome to my channel. I've been a property investor now for over 30 years and I've watched investors continue to make the same common investment mistakes. There's so many dirty tricks in the real estate industry and it's all caught up in a whole heap of sales hype. I want to cut through that sales hype and help investors avoid the common mistakes. I hope you enjoy the following content, but please remember to like and subscribe. G'day listeners and viewers across the country and welcome to another episode of Street Smart Property Investing where we, as always, take a look behind the headlines, have a look at what's really going on on the ground across the uh, national property markets and uh, as I have been in the past, I'm joined by two of the uh, leading experts in the field of property investing and two of my favourite uh, professionals that I lean on regularly for help and advice and you know, uh, navigation of the national property markets. Mr. Gordon Ruddy, one of the Morning, best, Phil. best uh, property investment advisors that uh, most known and trusted and respected property investment advisors in Australia. And it's a great title to have, mate. You're a good man. And Mr. Uh, Trent Durrington, the bulldog as we call him, he's uh, proving to be invaluable in a market like this with the fa- such a fast-paced, uh, you know, sort of seen broad-based boom really across the national property markets. Trent services with regards to screening, you know, developers and sites and locations and, you know, qualifying uh, property investments for, for property investors really being, you know, uh, king of that of that acquisition kind of role uh, in the national property markets. Very valuable service at the moment. So thanks for joining me, mate. Good on you, Phil. Good, right. Good to be back. Great it is good. Back. Now, we've been having a conversation over recent podcasts, and today we're going to continue with that. We decided because we're seeing such a big influx of property investors, you know, looking to get into the property market right at the moment with this, you know, this amazing window that we're seeing for, for property investing. Um, we decided to put together a five-part series to help people step their way through the whole purchase experience. Today, we are at step number four. Now, just to recap really quickly, now we know we're getting great feedback, Gordy. Great it? feedback, yeah. Unbelievable awesome. about this uh, practicality of these five steps. But... We started the conversation talking about step one, really before you just jump in, understanding what it takes to get into the market, understanding what you should be thinking about, about how to target the right property for you and what's going to, you know, really meet and and match the expectations that you're setting. So number one was about your why and, you know, picking the right kind of strategy, I guess, to get into the property market. Number two was where would you target? What would be those postcodes? What would that, you know, what do we look for? What have we proven are the best property locations to target at any given time in the uh, national property markets? Number three is once we'd found that location, how do we pick the right property type to invest in? Today, we're going to go beyond the scope of narrowing it down to picking the absolute best property type in that particular market. Now, we're going to start talking about controlling the contract. Now, this is step four, and I see so many people get emotional, boys. They get attached to a property that, you know, unfortunately, they start throwing the basics out the window. You know, they get uh, a fear of missing out. They jump onto a property. They jump into a contract. They haven't really controlled the deal. And that can be a very nasty thing. Mm. Now, at the top of the list, paying the right price would be the first thing. As soon as you become emotional, we're seeing it at the moment, mate. We're seeing people that are paying $100,000 more for properties because they're home buyers and they're emotional hundred thousand dollars more than two streets away on properties that you're putting together for investors. Yeah, that's right. Um, obviously, um, people talk about what is the value. Well, the value of a property is whatever someone's willing to pay. Mm-hmm. You know? So, um, trying to say that you're going to buy a property under market, under market value, um, I'm not always sure what that term means because at the end of the day, the value is what someone's going to pay. Mm. But in this market, you're right, Phil. Um, People are willing um, to pay that extra for a lifestyle, um, location, um, and compared to where they're coming from. Um, they're still affordable. cheap. Still, still cheap, very in- inexpensive. Um, so, you know, that's what investors are still still battling or um, still battling the, the owner-occupied driven boom that's going on. So let me qualify that for the listeners. What we're saying there is in our marketplace at the moment, existing stock, 
and it is market value because people are determining what market value is. They're determining that the $650,000 house is an affordable property for them, even though the locals might go, who the heck's going to pay 650000 for that property? In fact, the people coming from out of town might go, well, let's pay seven hundred to make sure that we can get that property secured, et cetera, et cetera. But the example that I'm giving is the fact that because of the way that we purchase properties and because of the way that most investors definitely need to, you know, consider purchasing properties because of the changes to negative gearing laws, we are purchasing brand new properties. Now, when you're in an estate, and at the moment most estates are full of owner-occupiers, it's just amazing for investors to get into those particular estates, but as you're securing a block of land, which is damn hard to do but as you're securing a block of land for an investor and then you're working out that package price of per square metre rates and you're really coming back to a fundamental value a real you know unemotional fundamental value per square metre rate on the land per square metre rate on the build the same eyes that a valuer is going to use when they walk in and they assess it and they take their you know calculator out and they assess what they believe the value is not what the you know, this wave of buyers might be prepared to pay, but what the, you know, that valuer determines the price is, and that's your same eyes you're looking through, is that true value on replacement, I guess, of the stock. Um, you know, we're finding that two streets away, that same size house, same size block of land, you know, owner occupiers are prepared to pay hundred, hundred and fifty thousand dollars more than that for the property. Yeah, that's right. Unique, that's right. mate. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, so we're we're seeing clients that are getting that um, equity uplift even before going unconditional on mm. contracts, and then if you put a six month construction period in there, um, there's some really big gains. You're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, capital uplift on completion. Yeah, you know, and then put a tenant in there and a positive cash flow. Um, creates a good opportunity to really um, expedite um, people's strategy. Gordy, you'd, you'd mm. understand that and, and talk about that um, to be able to maximise, you know, your short, medium, long-term strategy and, and uh, yeah. build equity mm. in your Duplicate first property. Quicker. Or, you know, it's uh, it's an exciting period for the for the investors. Mm. So if we come back to that, uh, you know, I guess that situation, mate, what we're now seeing is that, you know, for a long time, Gordy and I have been using the, the you know, the uh, system because we've been kind of, you know, closely connected, uh, pr- you know, through our own pr- personal property investment strategies and, you know, mateship and, and, and love for property investing. For the last 30 years, we've been looking at markets, you know, all over Australia Um we learnt many years ago that we uh, we don't need to know the values of all the different markets and it's a bit dangerous to pretend that you, you think you're an expert, mm. you know, and uh, we've determined that the best way to go into most markets and, and get a better understanding of the right price to pay is to get a valuation up front, mm. to get an independent bank panel value, not a, a local real estate agent or a mate of the developer or whatever, um, but we certainly don't let the seller set the price. We'd like to get that valuation um, up front. That's been a, you know, a, a, I guess so a trick all, of ours. We've always done it that way, yeah. yeah. And that's proved to be really good because at the end of the day, the banks are going to get their independent valuers to run their eyes mm. over it, et cetera, et cetera. So in the market and using your methodology, Trent, you know, that is a good starting point for people is to try to avoid existing stock and that, you know, high demand, highly competitive um you know, kind of uh, competition to buy and getting caught up in the emotional, you know, kind of tug of war for property, bring it back to a per square metre, or a, you know, a real mechanical mm. Um, mm. process. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, it's probably worth touching on that. Um, we're talking square metre rates and, and uh, fair and reasonable building prices and the likes. That's quickly moving as well due to this unprecedented um, construction boom that's going on. So... Um, and I so think the untrained eye would maybe think they're taking advantage, but that's not the case. It's mm. it's real cost, right? There's, it's yeah. a real problem out there at the moment. Trades, you know, um, material, um, lots of issues on that building front. Yeah, you certainly want to be dealing with a builder that's got their finger on the pulse mm-hmm. and is moving their pricing at the right time, which is fair and reasonable. Mm-hmm. Again, not, not gouging, but um, also understanding that, uh, you know, it's very clear that uh, supplies, supplies and materials um, is in short, short supply, mm-hmm. uh, timber, 
timber frames and trusses, even steel frames and trusses, uh, roofing. Um, you know, we've even got white goods imported from overseas. A whole range of plumbing. Here and heaps of yeah. stuff. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so many little, little uh, you know, I, Gordy mm. was telling me, you talk, talk, mm. tell the listeners uh, oh. about a couple of the things we talked about yesterday. So talking to one of the builders, you know, he was talking to an electrician. The electrician said to him, you know, Last month I was paying $82 a roll for my cable, mm. you know, copper cable with, with um, you know, just insulated. And Might be a couple ne- hundred metres of cable or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and then the, the price rise has gone, and one price rise has gone up 80%. Mm. So it's gone from 82 to whatever it was, $140 a roll. Mm. 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 That's, That's just one component of the building. Yeah. yeah, and this is all the little dominoes. You mm. know, I'm talking to mates that have been building kitchens for years. They're talking about they can't get white malamine, which is... First time he'd seen in 20-something years of being a cabinet maker. Certain hinges they can't get. Prices are changing. Um, the, big, the big guys are trying to, you know, uh, stockpile some some yeah, uh, materials, yeah, which the, the little guys, guys are going to be really yeah. uh, struggling. I've heard rumours of the biggest uh, builders, you know, sort of doubling rates on, uh, you know, trades like roofers and so yeah. forth to make sure they're going to, you know, get through pinch points in their, you know, kind of yeah. production lines and that's going to be issues for, for other people. Yeah, I just would hate to, hate to see a bloodbath at the end of this um, in 12 months' time with some of the smaller builders. I hope it really, you know, that's they're being wise with their pricing. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I hope they all get through it. But mm. it, from an investor standpoint, you want to make sure that, um, you know, your builder has um, allowed for, you know, the additional pricing requirements. Um, and it's picked up in your fixed price contract. Mm. A couple of things that come up there, mate, and that's an interesting one because, you know, before this, you know, huge, I guess, construction boom and this push into um, these regional markets and the saturation of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, you know, the trades around the construction and so forth being overwhelmed with work when they were probably concerned, you know, well, very concerned 12 months ago. Now there's just this crazy volume of construction underway. Um, I know that when you and I first, you know, started linking arms years and years ago with regards to what's the best way to move forward and, and, um, you know, target, you know, the right uh, properties in the right areas and so forth, you immediately said there's a certain, you know, profile of builder that presents a much safer proposition for investors. And that's something you do is you screen out. And there's a, you know, there's a sweet spot where they're building enough stock and they've got certain insurance levels and so forth that makes them much more resilient than the little players. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I can imagine some of the little players that are building more of a luxury-style home uh-huh. um, would would uh, potentially be good for you if you're building a primary residence, you know, sure. and you're a bit more hands-on during that design and construction phase. Uh, but for us that's looking for certainty around costs of our contract and that comes back to the, the finance structure... Uh, you don't want to eat into any um, reserves or buffers. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that entirely comes down to time and also um, your fixed price contract. So one thing that comes up there is that smaller guy that's building the, you know, the family home and the family home that's got much more of an emotional connection to the, to the product, it's very, very likely that there will be variations through a building cons- uh, you know, construction process. Uh, variations, as I've mentioned on previous podcasts, there's a famous sign at the back of uh, a building um, you know, company's staff room saying variations equals profits. You know, they're hoping that the client's going to m- want to make variations. There's a cost on the variation. There's a you know, profit margin on all the variations. And over the scope of a family home, those variations can, you know, can end up being tens of thousands of dollars of extra or profit more. for the mm. for the for the just profit for the uh, for the uh, building company and obviously much more to the client um, but in the scope of that mate a big part of uh, you know an investor's strategy is a fixed price con- a fixed price contract yeah that's right yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah. so so everything you do in the scope of putting together and controlling the contract is to determine the right price to pay and then make sure those goalposts aren't going to move that's right yeah, mm. yeah. it's um um, not that easy to find those builders, and you're right. There's a sweet spot in the type of builder that's willing to offer that. Uh-huh. Um, you know, well established, uh, building hundreds of homes a year, uh, can absorb any you know um, unforeseen costs when they uh-huh. go to contract stage, and on the basis that they've 
um, you know, put their hand up and said they're willing to offer a fixed price contract and then and also have long term relationships with people like us, mm-hmm. uh, they'll absorb those additional costs. Yeah, so what's, what's, what's uh, important to note too. There's a lot of builders out there who will say fixed price contract and the front of their contract is issued by the HIA. It says fixed price contract and someone goes, oh, I'm, I'm safe. And they don't go into the detail of the contract. But I know in every contract Trent does, in the special conditions of that contract, he says notwithstanding any of these clauses, which are clauses which would say if when we get the site we find such and such, we can, we can mm. charge you. Yeah. So even though it says fixed price, if someone's out there looking to build now, it's yeah, there's not necessarily fixed price unless yeah. you got someone who knows what they're doing like Trent does, pulls that contract apart and makes sure that at the end of the day it is absolutely 100% fixed. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. There is a, an art and it takes hours to mm. pull apart just a standard HIA contract um, when you're referencing, say, a condition earlier in the contract uh, but it's superseded by another condition later in the contract and you're talking a 50-page mm. contract, so... You put hours into hmm. analysing these contracts to make sure they are f- foolproof for the investor. Hmm. Mate, people are so busy. Everyone out there is so busy. You know, you can just see how so many property investors just stuff things up and hmm. make, you know, terrible mistakes. Like, so close to making a great decision and doing something really positive for the family and then it, you know, all spirals into something that's quite negative, quite ugly, you know, tens of thousands of dollars are lost you know, maybe set yourself back years and it's all so unnecessary if you just get the right advice at mm. the right time, right? Mm. Well, it's all time. If someone's got a lot of time and um, resource to put into it, fair enough, mm-hmm. you know, um, but we're all time poor, time poor mm. um, and, you know, we've... Have a team around you. you just like got, us, you we're co- a team. You we, know? We, um, we turn key the, from start to finish mm. and, and effectively a split contract, which where you're entering a land contract and entering a build contract, shouldn't be any more painful than um, effectively just entering a one contract mm. where you pay a deposit and settle on, uh, on completion. Yeah, and, and you know, man, there's some massive bonuses in doing that. You know, the clients are saving tens of thousands of dollars in, in stamp duty alone. Mm. I was having a conversation with, you know, one of our customers yesterday who were in the early stages... And one of the the questions was, you know, do we buy something that's established or Mm -hmm. do we buy something, you know, that we build? And when I went through that um, explanation of the benefits, not just the tax deductions which are ongoing and the better cash flow you're going to get, but just up front with, like, use the example of, you know, a $650,000 property. If you're buying a $650,000 property, it's probably about $27,000 worth of stamp duty if you buy that as a single house, an established house. But if you do it in a two-part, you only pay stamp duty in the land. So if the land's two fifty three hundred, you might be paying $7,000 in stamp duty. So it's a huge save. Even though you've got some interest during the construction, the it's savings nowhere near are that st- 20 no, grand, right? nowhere near it. Yeah, no, mm. there's a couple of other things that come up, and I think that's a really good one to point out because a mm. lot of people would get concerned about a two-part contract. Most real estate agents don't understand a two-part mm. contract. They, you know, I mean, we... We love them, you know. <laughs> That's a great mate, sort of real estate agents. And I know some of the best damn real estate agents in Australia, some of the hottest, in, you know, most <laughs> successful mm. real estate agents, and yet they come back to me and, and you know, we're dealing with them at the mm. moment, quite a few of them, mm. that are looking to buy in other states and other areas and they really don't understand a two-part, two-part contract. contract. They're just not familiar yeah. with it. No. They're so used to selling, you know, mum and dad's, family house down the street mm, yeah, one yeah. part contract first person in first in best dressed you know i mean it's a very specific role they're there to serve yeah. the vendor right yeah. you know yeah well and and those agents don't have well, i don't feel like they have a real connection with the whole uh property market nationally oh no you know they live in their own little igloo well mate which they're is busy fine, they are busy they the guys busy. that survive yeah. that industry yeah. they are flat out seven days a week in their local market staying at the top of their game yeah. And they know that local market like the back of their hand. And, and, and of course, if you're a mum and dad or you're selling a family home in that local market, you need them and you need the best, you know, the people at the top of their game. 
but man, they're lost when they go to another state or another product or you know, man, they're just mm. it's just it's a fish out of water. Mm. Yeah, it is. No, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Another conversation we had yesterday, Gordy, which I think is really interesting as well. We talked about because uh, a couple of angles of this has come up. The you know the process of building and the size of builders and so forth. There is a um, you know each state and and um, and uh, you know the circumstances may differ slightly, but there's always a uh, level of insurance behind mm-hmm. every construction, right? There's a, you know, a, a need for insurance to be taken out on the construction. And so the homeowner's warranty, you're talking about the homeowner's yes. warranty that protects the... The builder, the, uh, the, the, the vendor, the, right? The, uh, sorry, no, the, the, purchaser, the purchaser, sorry. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's always the fallback and, and very rarely, you know, I, I can only remember once or twice in my 30-something years of property investing where I've seen that needed to be lent on, you mm-hmm. know what I mean, where construction hasn't finished but there was warranty be- and there was insurance behind that for another builder to step in and finish that for the for the person, for the investor. So it very rarely happens um, but th- that is always there, right? And, uh, of course, you know, the people that take out those insurances are rated. You know, there's a level of risk for the insurance company. So, of course, the people that... Trent would normally, the builders, the scale of the builders and, and personal mate of, of ours and particularly yours, Gordy, who's the biggest regional developer in, in New South Wales, very, very uh, established, you know, reputable man, uh, who's at the top, the highest level of um, safety when it comes to building in, in you know, the, you can't get more recognised of his level of, uh, you know, security. Uh, for the for the bill uh, for the uh, investor uh, going through that construction phase, but he was telling you how much that insurance process is, how much more expensive that's just become. Did yeah, you so share he, that he, with Trent. I don't even know if Trent's heard that. I don't think I have spoken to Trent about that. So We're talking specifically about a dual income property. Well, of a, a duplex, anything that's going to be duplex. strata title. Okay. If it's going to be strata title and they've gone across the board and just. Because they see that as a as a higher risk development for for um, for a builder, so they've increased the just the insurance, just the homeowner's warranty insurance by uh, fifteen thousand dollars. That's a one-off payment, fifteen thousand dollars. So now Crazy. to build a duplex, they're paying thirty thousand, I think it's thirty-two thousand dollars just in homeowner's warranty, and they are on a twenty-five percent discount on what the insurance policy is because of their. You know, level of security, stem- right? Yeah. So I can't imagine what the, you know, the smaller builders are. And, and you know, we've spoken to them before and we, 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 we've spoken to people about how much work can you do and they go, well, you know, i really got to finish this these three jobs before I'm even allowed to start another one. So you don't really want to be dealing with, with builders that are on that tight where the, you know, the warning people won't insure them beyond, you Crazy, know, a right? few yeah, jobs. Yeah, no, I'm not up to speed with that. Mm. Um, and it, uh, that obviously gets passed on to the purchaser. Uh, that'd be based on the Royal Commission and uh, all the issues they've had in New South mm. Wales around multi-storey developers. Um, so the knock-on effect to the residents. It's got to go somewhere, right? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. got to be picked up. It's yeah. got to be picked up. And and the so thing that's interesting. It is. Really you think about it. Like if you look at that sort of uh, construction and you look at the budget to build that, you know, you pick a number because people would think about the finished price, but you've got to take the land content off, right? So you take the land content away, and the construction on that duplex. I don't know, Gordy. I'm just going to pick a number, but let's let's call it. I don't know, four hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, you know, like for five hundred thousand. Probably closer 000, to five hundred. Yeah. If you pick, uh, you know, um, what was seventeen thousand dollars for insurance and make that thirty-two thousand dollars for insurance, that percentage of the five hundred thousand is a—it's a big percentage mm. of, of uh, inside of that construction allowance, right? So we are now looking at, um, you know, forecasts. We're building, you know, packages are, are likely to move. An average 200 square metre house is likely to move by twenty to thirty thousand dollars. I think is probably likely in the next six months. Yeah, yeah, and that's that'll have some effects around uh, potential valuation uh, issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, only with, you know, trying to figure out where the new standard is. Mm-hmm. Um, so that. Uh, there might be some issues arise from that mm-hmm. uh, until the value is, in fairness to them, trying to understand, okay, we, we know there's pricing is moving, wh- where is the new level going to be? Mm-hmm. Um, so, th- you know, this, it's an interesting time. I mean, a booming market, it's unprecedented how these additional issues are, are popping into the market um, all, all at once. 
Well, yeah. mate, it's it's interesting because it isn't like another time in the market. Um, you know, I know how much we're scurrying, you know, at the moment because we've got five times the amount of people that want to talk to us, you know. We've got, you know, a fraction, maybe 10% of the stock opportunity as to what we would have normally have. So 500% more inquiry level of people saying, please help us out, right? Yet maybe 10% of what we would have had normally to look at as far as opportunities to pick from, right? And most of the time now, we've got a reverse engineer. You know, we've got somebody that Gordy's worked with and said, yep, we need this particular price point, this profile of property, this is what we're looking for, this is the perfect thing to put our hands on, but Trent can't open up a Chinese menu and go, well, here's 17 to pick from, Gordy. Mm, no. <laughs> nor, well, nor do we want to, you know, no. it's... Um we always try and stay, regardless of where we are in the cycle, a bespoke model, meaning, uh, yeah, we never have a Chinese uh, no. type menu of, oh, here's a property, you know. No, um, but the thing is, mate, it really becomes something where we go, okay, all right, put it on the list, we're going to try the best we can, and with laser focus, you're looking for a block of land to hopefully become available, whether it's someone's finances fall do- fallen over or something, so you can just be ready, grab hold of that block as quick as possible. Now, that means then you've got to kind of uh, reverse engineer and go, can we get that plan onto that block? Does this work? There's a lot of work going into it at the moment. And Still no risk. A lot of work, a lot more work. We look five times harder for a, putting a package together, but still no risk for the investor. No. It's all conditional to um, them securing their finance. So, um, you know, that's, that's okay, though. Because well, yeah. mate, it's the way it is, right? Yeah, it's just yeah. a different mar- different stage of the market yeah. cycle. But once again, h- how could an investor – there's no way in the world an investor could do it on their own. There's zero chance. Mm. You couldn't get the block. You couldn't do the reverse engineering, put it all together in time to meet the timelines. Before you step over a line and you're getting yourself into a contract you don't understand, you're going unconditional on something that you shouldn't because it isn't well planned, it isn't hasn't had the due diligence process taken, you know, full account of all of the things. Mate, it is an unusual time in the market, right? But let's just recap a couple of things because I've got to bring this together and we've got to make sure that uh, investors walk away going, here's the key things. Of course, we started the conversation in controlling the contract, talking about controlling the price, right? Make sure you're paying the right price. In a market like this, we don't have the luxury of having time to say, well, let's get a valuation and work back. We've got to be able to get it back to square metre rates, unemotional buying, et cetera, et cetera, and you need to have that knowledge to pull that together. You've then got to get to the point where you've got a fixed price contract, right? So you are going to get a turnkey product, and we want to take possession of a product and not have a cent to spend. We, we want window dressings, antenna on the roof, facing in the right direction. We want the whole thing ready to go for the tenants to move in. A lot of people drop the ball on that. You know what I mean? They don't realise, well, hang on, I thought that'd come with landscaping mm. and we've seen all this stuff, Gordy. Seen it all. Seen it all, right? And then if you've got a fixed price contract, you want to make sure, because you're settling on the land and there's a construction process, you want to make sure, and as Gordy said, we may save 20 or more thousand dollars on stamp duty but there is some construction finance right so through when the slab goes down you've got a little bit of interest to pay now on that you know that stage of your drawdown of your loan frames go up etc cetera, etc cetera, through the construction phase and you can work out and we do work out and allow for the interest component to service that loan through until the keys get handed over the tenant moves in and then it turns into the investment property that we've determined right from the start is the experience we want to have, which is typically cash flow positive, Mm -hmm. but we're servicing some interest through that time. Now, Trent, you also play devil's advocate and say, well, what if? What if they can't get materials? What if the weather turns bad and we have six months of torrential rain? And you mitigate that risk as well for investors. Yeah, well, there's certain terms coming back to the contract, um, you know, that there's got to be valid reasons uh, for those time delays um, and extensions of time have got to be requested correctly. Um, so, you know, we, we do mitigate those um, and there's some uh, backups there. Uh-huh. Um, again, it comes back to our builders and our relationships understanding that in many occasions our, our investor doesn't have too much of a buffer to continue holding costs and they appreciate that. Mm-hmm. You know, these these investors may potential 
you know, by purchase two or three properties, construct through them, you know, over the next decade, um, you know, so through our relationships that, you know, the builders again absorb those costs. And and uh, I know that in many cases in the past you've been able to negotiate a maximum period of time for construction and then the, the um, investor's able to pass over those holding costs. Is that happening still, you know, in market conditions today? Yeah, it is, but um, I'm seeing building times, you know, that I, longer. a type typically that I would negotiate. The, the builders are now negotiating with me with, the, you know, trying to find... And not in any way do I want to put our builders in... Um, a hard position either. That's, no, that's you've got to be fair. You've got to be realistic. You've got to be fair, yeah. you know. Um, so, again, that's we're just trying to find that median ground at the moment to um, make sure it's a, a pleasant experience for both parties. So it's a really important part of the puzzle to make sure that a, uh, I guess, a investor trying to do this on their own doesn't just walk into an open-ended contract yeah. where maybe there's a certain stage in the process where the builder goes, oh, you know, there's not too much more to draw down on that construction loan. Um, maybe I'll start a few more slabs, mm. start some other, pro- you know, builds, get some mm. other construction mm. going. You're servicing 90% of the loan because you've just about drawn down the whole thing and really you've only got, you know, five weeks left of completion and, and turf and all of those sorts of layers, but the builder doesn't have any pain attached to not finishing it. And we've seen that sort of stuff, Gordy. We need to motivate the builder to finish. He's Absolutely. Got to, he's got to know it's going to cost him if he doesn't get that thing finished. Yeah, mm. and the investor needs to know that they don't need to stress about mm. it, that uh, the, you know that weight's going to land on the, on the uh, developer's shoulders. That's right. So, you know, one of the things that at the centre of having a great contract is actually having a great conveyancing team. And this is another thing that uh, you could underestimate. Like, of course, we've... You know, one of the one of the gentlemen that uh, his company handles a lot of our transactions. Um, he's a name partner in one of the legal top legal firms in Sydney. But when Gordy and I first, you know, uh, really had contact uh, with Dean and his team, we um, we basically had a big head clash because mm. he, he was on he the was other acting, side. He was acting for the builders on mm. the other side, right? And he couldn't believe our expectations around these fixed price contracts and delayed settlement mechanisms, you know, if building periods went over time and all of these conditions that we went, nah, take that out of the contract, take that out of the contract. Um, and he was he was quite offended, right? Mm. He was quite offended that we were expecting that because that's not typical. And then he came back, oh, we ended up putting the deal together and it all went through, but he ended up coming back maybe six or eight weeks later and saying, you know what, guys, I've never seen that done before it's just not standard most people are entering contracts that you know don't take those things into account and ever since then he's been not just a big fan but he's helped become quite a specialist i guess in that area now only highlight highlight that because what we're doing isn't standard it's not typical you know i mean a lot of contracts will not have that level of detail um and most conveyancing teams wouldn't look for those things or suggest those things. Mm. Is that a fair comment? Yeah, it is. Mm. Yeah, Absolutely. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why I have um, multiple <laughs> inquiries or uh, <laughs> queries from vendor, sellers, solicitors, yeah. uh, questioning some of these terms that we continue to put in the contracts and yeah. insist go in the contracts. Um, so, yeah, you're right. It's t- certainly not normal. Yeah. You know, and there's some things there that we notice when we have uh, investors that choose to use their own solicitors, which is fine, you know, and so forth. But you really start knowing you've got to, you know, manage that process Mm. and somewhat educate the solicitors to help them understand, you know, that this is possible. You Mm. can do these things. This we 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 Mm. do make this stuff happen, right? So it's a pretty pretty powerful thing. You know, that the right conveyance, or in our case, lawyers understand. And their team understand the finance process too, the refinancing of a, um, a couple of properties to f- purchase of the new property, um, trying to pull all those lenders together, ready for settlement. Um, certainly specialised investment lawyers, hmm. um, I think, are critical hmm. uh, versus your uh, smaller conveyancer that um, sits in the local local office in your local area that's uh, just doing a, a single contract on an existing property. It's, it's two different transactions. It's ab- mate, the thing that becomes very apparent is if you get an old school solicitor, you're using a bank rather than a broker, you start putting a couple of those basic old school 
you know, standard uh, team members, <laughs> you know, into a current investment model, my gosh, you're, you're, you're way behind the eight ball before yeah. you start, Add, right? Added in a, an accountant. And, oh, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And... Uh, and that's where we all were 15, 20 years ago. Everyone just had, we dealt with one of the big four banks. We had, you know, we had a, uh, you know, a typical guy we talked to there. We had an accountant that was just, you know, you know, uh, very beige in their thoughts and conservative yeah. and all of that sorts yeah. of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, your local solicitor um, was, you know, you know, so used to just, uh, you know, the standard contracts that just, you know, they do the title searches and all of those layers. They knew all of the, the fundamentals. They were, you know, solid at what they did, but they didn't know how to, you know, think differently when it came to, you know, investment purchases and, uh, you know, the requirements around that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's, um, it's, it comes back to the team. It's a, it's a lot of moving parts. Um, depending on starting with how your finance is structured, um, in in educating or communicating with all parties involved to bring it all together to you know make it happen, so uh, it's a very much a big team environment. And people have wondered why the average investor never gets past one or two properties. Yeah, well, you, if you balls up one of those factors, well, then it becomes an unpleasant. Um, it becomes a handbrake, right? Yeah, a handbrake yeah, on yeah, your yeah, life. Yeah, a, yeah, you know, yeah. a, yep. I'll never invest again, etc., etc., etc. And you it's just go, that. "Oh my gosh, all that. Yeah. why the heck does that happen?" And yeah. and when so much of that stuff is very easy to avoid. Now, Gordy, we talked about um, you know coming into a contract environment. Trent and I got you know excited by all those mechanics and triggers and mechanisms, but you brought really one important thing to the surface this morning before we started the podcast. You said, "You know what." The first thing I'd be doing is just stopping my client and saying, you know, that's all great. We've got that contract, great. But is this now be still the right property yeah, for you? Yeah, just go back to the beginning and have a look at, as you mentioned, why are we doing this? They would have had, you know, in our, in our, in our strategy sessions, we would have spoke about, you know, what we believe the numbers would look like, um, you know, from a cash flow point of view, you know, where we think the, you know, the value of the property is going to go, when do we think we can duplicate and, you know, as you go along, particularly in this market where things are moving so quickly, it's easy to, you know, take a little step to the left and end up somewhere where you, we didn't, that wasn't initially where we wanted to go. Uh -huh. So we need to just come back, realign ourselves, like find a plane, you know, uh -huh. like if you, one degree off in... Mate, over you know, 20 years you could really miss the target, yeah. right? You know, so I mean, just and that's come what back, happens. Have a look at it, make sure we, you know, we, we, we've got our numbers right and, you know, we still feel comfortable. You can still be excited, but it's we're excited and we're emotional because the numbers are right. Yeah. yeah. No, and it's a really important thing. We, we're we obviously at the point now where we want to control the contract. We're going to lock down a property, but the whole reason that we want to be locking down that property is because it is the perfect vehicle to create the wealth requirement that you've decided that you is important to you in your mm. life. It's going to meet the timelines. It's going to give you the, the outcome. It's really a vehicle to create wealth. Mm. And people can get emotional. That's exactly what it is. Mate, yeah. People can get emotional. They can get excited about a property. They can have a fear of missing out. And then common sense can get pushed to the side. And, uh, you know, Trent, you're at the, at the coalface of, of um, making sure that all that property detail is right. But you may not have the knowledge of what that client is trying to uh, achieve, right? You, you just know no, that no, it, yeah. it's it is the perfect property, it is the ideal package, etc. But Gordy's role is to make sure it's the right package for that client. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and that is true because that could be the right package for someone, someone slightly else. different, right? Yeah. And that's a really, really important part of the process. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. Gordy's role in in also. Um, facilitating the finance with the broker, uh -huh. you know, working, you know, linking arms to make sure the right strategy around that is, is important. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes that relates back to a certain property and area and um, a lender that fits well for a per person's strategy may not be lending in that particular postcode at that time. Uh -huh. You know, there's lots and lots of different tangibles. Sure. And the big thing, guys, is if you're going to exchange this contract, you're going to... Uh, you're going to move forward. You need to know it's right for you, but you also need to know that everyone around you, your team is fully supportive. Your finance is approved or you wouldn't be signing yep. an unconditional contract. It would be subject to finance. Just those basics, the team stuff, the conversations, the common sense, bring it back, slow it down, take the emotion out of it and just walk your way through a great contract 
all those conditions, all of that stuff that's there to protect you um, before you sign, before you exchange. Yeah. All good, right? Yeah. So that brings us to the end of, you know, step number four, you know, controlling the contract, making sure that you really exercise and, and you secure that property the right way. In our next podcast, we're going to talk about the landlord experience. We're going to talk about the handover of that property. We're going to talk about what we do as property investors to maximise and, and duplicate our portfolios moving forward. But hopefully the listeners got something good out of today's content, some helpful stuff about you know, controlling the contract. Any last comments, mate? The only last comment I'll make is, and I'll just hark back to one of our earlier podcasts when we were not in this series, it was before that, when, you know, in the real estate industry as such, everything has been, you know, set up to support the, the vendor, the seller. And the reason you do what you do is to support the purchaser. Mm -hmm. And thinking about what we spoke about today, even with contracts, like, like land contracts and building contracts, they really are set up to support that vendor process. Absolutely. But, you know, what we've spoken about today is is all about protecting and looking after the purchaser. So out of today, that's, that's what I get. It's, you know, it's going right back to when we first started. It's all about, yeah, it's about the purchaser. We want to protect them, put them in the best possible position to have the best possible experience, which is what we're going to talk about on the next and mate, most of those, Most of those lessons and most of those... Um, you know, uh, the, the requirements that we now speak about and the systems that we use, it's driven by 30 years of experience, making little mistakes along mm -hmm. the way, saying how can we avoid that mistake? How can we make sure that never happens again? So why would you learn from your own mistakes when you can learn from others' mm -hmm. mistakes? And, and, and for us, we've just tried to, you know, fine-tune a recipe to minimise the risk down as far as humanly possible, you know, and maximise the results. Mm. And, and uh, you know, like you said, Gordy, it's, it's a, you know, the Australian uh, real estate industry has done a lot over the years to protect the, uh, the vendors but done very little to protect the buyers. Mm. So, you know, someone had to step up and do it. So I'm really glad you guys share, you know, my passion for, for helping investors navigate this space and, and um, you know, I'm sure the listeners are getting some good stuff out of the, the content we're sharing. Yeah, I hope so. I hope yeah. so. It's um, just all – it is it, – it can be daunting but um, for us we – we make it hmm. non-daunting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, I, I think, you know, having a, having a yeah. great team is definitely yeah. going to give you that sleep at night factor and, yeah. and, and yeah. mitigate that risk down, you know, as much as humanly possible. Yeah. So thanks for joining me, guys. Uh, we'll talk again on the next one. We'll come back and we'll touch on, you know, kind of that last phase of being, uh, I guess, the uh, lazy investor and having a great landlord experience. Thanks for joining yeah. me, boys. Thanks, See you next Good week. Order. Good on you, mate. Thanks for watching, guys. Don't forget to subscribe and also feel free to leave me a question. I look forward to helping as many property investors as possible. Take care and we'll talk soon.